let's let's go into some of this stuff around. Um, well, let, let's just start with sort of something you've already alluded to. Let's explain what it is, talk about how much it matters, and then kind of get into some examples. So let's let's start with a term that many people have heard before, but I, I don't think most people understand what VO2 max really means. And eventually we're gonna talk about running efficiency and lactate threshold, and we're gonna get into all of this stuff. But let's, let's make sure people understand what VO2 max is, both in an absolute term, and then in a manner that we normalize it by, by weight. Um, and uh, what it is and what it isn't, how it's measured and how it matters. And maybe we'll even talk about some notable exceptions. Sure. Yeah. So VO2 max is the one physiological parameter that anyone who's involved in endurance has heard of and and has some sense of. And the, the sort of the first order analogy is it's kind of the size of your engine. So physiologically, VO2 max is telling you how much oxygen or how quickly you can take oxygen from the air into your lungs, uh, pump it, get it into your blood, pump it to your muscles, and then have your muscles use it in the metabolic processes that will provide energy to move you to do whatever you want to do. So uh, it's it's a rate. It's how much oxygen per unit time can you process absolutely flat out. Now, the, the sort of backstory here is it was it was first sort of discussed or measured in the 1920s by a guy named A.V. Hill, who was actually a very good runner. And, and the observation that he made is if you have someone, you, you ask someone to go out and run at a, at a gentle pace, they'll consume, let's say, two liters of oxygen per, per minute. Then you tell them to speed up. Now they're, they're doing three liters of oxygen per minute. You tell them to speed up again. And now they're going pretty much, maybe not as fast as they can, but they're going fast. And they're using four liters of oxygen per minute. And so you tell them to speed up again. And you measure it and they're like, oh, they're only using four liters of oxygen a minute, just like last time. And so speed up again. And they're still just using four liters of oxygen a minute. There's a plateau. There's a point at which, even though you're working harder, you're not using any more oxygen. And so this plateau looks like it's a physiological limitation. And it probably is in, in some sense, you know, it's a controversial thing. But basically, you've reached a point where no matter how hard you push yourself, you can't get more oxygen. And so you can still go faster because you're starting to use other forms of energy. But this is the limits of your aerobic system. This tells you, well, what it tells you, uh, we can get into. <laughs> it, it's not clear what it tells you, but it, it, tells you, it, it tells you exactly what I just said. It tells you how much, how much oxygen you can use. Does that tell you exactly how fast you can run? No, there's, there's a, there are a lot of other factors. But it's, that tells you what sort of aerobic engine you have to play with. Now, people have you know, talk, I mean, as I remember in high school, I mean, we would sort of talk about, well, which athletes have the highest VO2 max? Is it the Norwegian cross country skiers? Is it the professional runners and cyclists and things like that? But, um, people are usually used to hearing these numbers reported, not in liters per minute, but in milliliters per minute per kilogram. So give an example. So people understand those differences. Cause we usually talk about the outliers is a, is a number that's a, a, a bigger number than two liters or five liters. It would be, you know, sort of 75, 80 milliliters per, just explain to people how, how those are different. Sure. So I, I'll, I'll use my own numbers. I, when I, you know, typically when I was tested, I could get about a little bit more than five liters per minute. So 5.1, 5.2, if I remember correctly. Um, now, if you compared me to a rower, the rower would make me look pathetic because the rower would be using seven liters a minute or, or, or more. Um, but the rower is also huge, uh, you know, twice my size or whatever. And, and, and so that doesn't necessarily mean that that rower is, is better at using oxygen for me because the rower has way more muscle. And so the rower is, is, is the, the amount of oxygen reaching any given muscle cell may be lower. So if you want to compare apples to apples between athletes of different sizes, you divide, at least for a crude approximation, you just divide by weight. And so the numbers we usually hear are rather than liters of oxygen per minute, it's milliliters of oxygen per minute per kilogram of body weight. So for me, five liters of oxygen per, per minute works out to something like 80 milliliters of oxygen per minute per kilogram of body weight. Um, so, and, and, you know, there's a whole rabbit hole to go into is to say, well, 
why are we dividing by whole body weight? Because, you know, there's a bunch of things like skeleton, you know, there, there there's not just an, an organs and stuff that right. don't scale. The, the adipose tissue doesn't matter. I mean, you could argue a better comparison would be total liters per minute divided by lean mass divided by time uh, or normalized to time. And then you're, you know, you're at least getting the, the metabolically active tissue, presumably. Yeah. And, and you know, you'll, there's papers where they do things like let's divide by weight to the power of 0.68 yeah. or 0.7, which is another way of getting it. Effectively, it's a way of approximating just the lean mass, yeah. the metabolically active tissue. So, and you can go down that rabbit hole, but as, as, as I suspect what you'll, you'll want to get to is it's like at a certain point, it, it, it doesn't matter that much anyway. So we don't need to, to uh, like, view, you can't just measure someone's VO2 max and know how fast they're going to race. So it's 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 useful, but it's not it, it really, especially for comparing between people. Now, comparing within yourself, it, it tells you something if if you've increased or or if your VO two max has decreased. But in that sense, it doesn't matter what what you're dividing by. I remember there was a guy that I used to ride with, and this was not that long ago, maybe five or six years ago, when I was still, you know, somewhat competitive at least with myself, um, and. Uh, actually, it's funny. My number was just like yours, except I was heavier. So I was about 5.1 to 5.2 liters, but I weighed more. So that worked out to about 70 mils per mig per kig was my VO2 max. His was 55 to 60, but I there was never a day that I could ride faster than him. Not one. There's simply, and, and I always felt like, although we did the test so many times, I kept feeling like the machine must have been broken on him. Like, I knew my 70 was about right because I'd been tested so much and that was lower than it had been when I was younger. So it seemed appropriate, but I was always convinced that that there's no way he's only 55. The reality of it is he may well have been, and he may have simply been a far more efficient athlete, which we're, we're going to get into. Um, before we get to the story of Oscar Svensson, let's talk a little bit about historically what people have believed the limits are of VO2 max. Yeah, you know what? We don't. I mean, we don't even have to go very far historically to get into a whole mudslide of of confusion and debate and 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 disagreement. Um, there's a there's a lot of places along the the way that that could, in some circumstances, be the bottleneck. Uh, normally, people tend to assume that. Um, so, what what is it that causes VO two max to plateau? Is essentially what I think what we're talking about. And 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 just one thing I should add here: it's like, why is that interesting? It's because you think, well, if you want to measure endurance, just have someone run a mile or whatever, you know, as hard as they can. But any test like that depends on motivation, depends on whether you pace it right. There's all these factors that come into it. The nice thing about VO2 max is that in theory, it's independent of uh, of motivation. That's why people, that's why scientists like it, because it doesn't matter if 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 you know the 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 subject doesn't really care about the study. If you see a plateau, you know that's that's a property of their body and not a product of whether they were excited about the study. So the question, yeah, the question is this plateau, what is it that causes it? And it could be in the lungs, it could be the heart, it could be the circulation, it could be the muscle's ability to extract it. And that I don't want to pretend that I know the answer because it's still controversial. The, the picture that emerges is that almost every part along this cascade is engineered right to the point, more or less to, to what it needs to be. And so if you perturb any of those, uh, those elements, it could, you, you can get limitations. So for example, the conventional wisdom is that your lungs are not a limitation. You can always breathe enough in. And so then the question is, can you, uh, uh, uh diffuse enough oxygen from your lungs into your bloodstream and so on and so forth? Um, there are situations where, and, and it's been for decades, it's been conventional wisdom that the lungs don't respond to training because they're overbuilt. Uh, there was just a paper published, a big review uh, in the last month or two, arguing that, you know, in some cases, the lungs aren't overbuilt. And one of the situations is highly trained endurance athletes. They can be limited by their ability to, uh, to, to get enough oxygen in. And you can also run into situations where an athlete is so fit, their heart is so strong, it can... Uh, it pumps blood past your lungs so quickly that it doesn't have time to fully stock up on oxygen. You get something called exercise-induced arterial hypoxemia. So this 
This is usually an issue at altitude, but in elite endurance athletes is actually about half of them exhibited even at sea, sea level. So they're already running into a limitation just in getting oxygen from their lungs to their bloodstream. And then at every stage of the way, there can be limitations if anything is knocked off kilter. Uh, and, and certainly right down to the ability of the muscles to first extract the oxygen from the bloodstream and then the, to to make use of it metabolically in the in the mitochondria. So it's there, there isn't one si si single answer, which is why you get these debates, because everyone is, I have evidence that this is the limit. It's like, yeah, but I have evidence that this is the limit, and that's the limit, and they're all the limit. Yeah, I've always wanted to see the experiment where you took a group of athletes, and maybe this has been done, um, and you, you run them all to max, and then you reduce the FiO2 of the incoming oxygen. So normally we do it with room air. So you're getting a, a, a fractional inhalation of oxygen is 21%. And the way, of course, just for the listener, the way these things work is the, the way they're calculating how much oxygen is being consumed is they're measuring the uh, the concentration of oxygen on the way out. So you're calculating the delta. And so I've always thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to start selectively dropping FiO2, 21%, 20%, 19%, 18%. Now, presumably, if the lungs aren't the limitation, you should still see the same absolute delta. And you could at least start to eliminate one of those variables, which would be FiO2 and capillary exchange. And then you start pointing to some of these other variables. Uh, again, I'm sure somebody has done this experiment, but uh, I don't know what it yielded. Yeah, pr 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 probably not with the, the fine tooth comb that, that, that you're suggesting. And people have compared, you know, 21% to 10% or whatever, and 15%. And uh, yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's interesting, it's, it's interesting when you go to altitude or, or, you know, or the equivalent, when you reduce yeah, the yeah. amount of oxygen, uh, Funny things happen. Like there's, uh, you know, the the first thing you would think would happen is like you can't get enough oxygen, so you're gonna be, go anaerobic sooner. You're gonna produce more lactate, and yet the opposite happens. There's something called the lactate paradox. If you if you try and exercise to exhaustion at lower levels of altitude, you actually give up when your lactate levels are lower than you would at sea level. And so and and there's debate about what causes this, and even whether it's a real thing. But the the picture that that makes sense to me is is that it's. These things are not just about how much oxygen is making it to the muscle. It's also like what is the what is your brain oxygen level? And so you're you're getting these other circuit breakers that are starting to come down that aren't even on this path mm -hmm. from mouth to lungs to to blood to to muscle. There there's other factors that are saying, whoa, wait a second, oxygen's getting a little low, so we're gonna actually cut off the supply to the muscles or reduce it in order to make sure that we don't get stupid. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.